project meant for the school and for the students and for the teachers, and then try to share it much more widely over the next couple of years. So that's kind of the thing. So I'm happy to entertain your comments and questions. Hi, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Mika Tan from Singapore. And uh, I was just wondering, the QR codes, um, how do you, could you monitor their ac um, people's access to yeah. them? And do you, could you monitor them geographically? Yes, like, we do. We can. We don't always do that, but we can monitor them geographically. And you know, when you look at that data, you can see sort of spikes, and you can see flat lines, and you can see spikes again, depending on what kind of. I mean, you have to get people to interact with it, right? So there's the kind of casual, like, oh, what's that? But then there's the more targeted, like, you know, there's a tour going on on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock, and so you'll see, you know, great spikes. A lot of, we, and we not only use the QR, but we always have the web address, too, so the people that are not, um, don't have a smart device or don't have the right technology to link can just uh, look online. Um, so we do a lot of promotion on Facebook too, and when we do a promotion of a story, you know, there'll be like a huge surge in it. Um, we haven't been really asked to do kind of geocoding, but I think that that would be, like if we really do a community-focused project, that would be something that would be good to build into it. It's, I mean, because um, it's really powerful to have data about access and yeah. people looking at the information. Yeah. and. With something like that, I can imagine it's a smartphone. You can probably get a lot more information about, um, for example, if this person saw this ad in, say, New York, and mm -hmm. then continues to look at that website somewhere yeah. else, yeah. or if you could sort of map it out, that might say a different story. Do you know how to do that? Well, with GIS, but with a lot of coding and stuff. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think it's possible. Yeah. yeah. No, I know it's possible. There are all these organizations that are global organizations. So another conversation I'm involved with with Ashoka is something that they're calling feedback labs, which are mostly generated out of the developing world with large global organizations that are doing development work in Africa, Asia, not so much Latin America, but and the idea is, you know, how do you get the input from the community into these large-scale development schemes that are often a complete mismatch to the community. Like, here's the community, they're living their life, here's the Aswan Dam, you know, or whatever it is. I mean, that's unfair, but you know what I mean. Um, and how do you, like, lessen that gap, and how do you bring people's ideas to bear on these large uh, project. So they do, there's an organization called Ushahidi, Ushahidi, which started in Africa based on crisis management uh, and uh, election, uh, you know, fairness work, and they have a really sophisticated geocoding, uh, and they can tell you exactly where um, a text is coming from, or uh, so it, it's, it's out there, I just don't understand it or really use it very much. The uh, reaching out to the people who are raised in violence, men particularly, yeah. and trying to come at some of those resilience factors. I'm first curious what you learned, and then also how do you take what you learned and leverage that? That's very hard because it's a very political, a very politicized um, set of interventions. Um, but what I learned was that. Just like in the mentoring world, uh, there's all this information about how a caring adult uh, is like such a huge and important quiver, you know, arrow in the quiver of um, resilience. That's the case with these young men, with these, well, they weren't young necessarily when I interviewed them, but growing up, but it was a woman that they had a very close relationship with who, um, I mean, it's so kind of awful to talk about in a way because what that relationship with an adult woman who was not their mother, who was being beaten usually, um, 
it allowed them to see an adult woman as a human being instead of as a you know a punching bag or an object in an objectified way. And so that relationship was kind of translatable then to their own mother and their own experience of. They all talked about like this moment in time where they felt like they had to choose to either be, sadly in their words, of, uh, to side with the victim or to side with the victimizer. And they, they really, across the board, said that this relationship with this other adult woman kind of gave them the ability to, to not side with the victimizer. And a lot of these guys struggled with violence. It wasn't like they were like, I swear this off, I'm a Quaker, you know, I'm not, never gonna do this. But um, they struggled in a way that was very conscious and was very um, self-aware and very aware of the fact that it would be easy for them to kind of slip, you know, go down that rabbit hole. And um, some of these guys were really severely bad. You know, they were really, really, very badly, and um, you just wouldn't imagine that they would end up being kind of on the other side. The what we did with it was that we created this. So this was while I was, while I was at Connect, and um, at that time, and still even to this day, most of the batterers' intervention initiatives that are labeled batterers' intervention are run out of the criminal justice system. So you mostly have to be arrested before you're gonna get referred to one of those programs. And they're very behavior mod oriented. And they don't really believe in people telling their story. And that's like, that's not only not done, but it's completely rejected as a technique or a strategy. Um, so, like with the women who said, you know, the most important thing was for me to protect my kids, we figured that for guys it was similar too. They didn't, they didn't want their kids to grow up and be in pain, you know, physical or emotional pain. And so we, we kind of created a father's initiative where we used their stories about growing up to connect with their experience of being a father. You know, it was only for guys who were dads, so there was a whole lot of people left out. But it, it did become a very powerful program um, that I couldn't get funding for, and lasted about six years, and then kind of died out. And it's kind of resurfaced now, because that world has softened a little bit in terms of what they think is worth trying out, and there's more interest in early intervention rather than waiting for someone to get arrested. There's a little bit more experimentation in the world. But when you did hear the stories of men who, and I have interviewed men who are batterers, there's a lot of pain around their childhood. So what else is there, right? But um, there's, there is almost always this like scared little boy hiding in the closet or something like that, witnessing a terrible event between their father and their mother that they're so interested in blotting out and, and, and ignoring or forgetting. Um, and that's like a place of a lot of, uh, you know, batterers don't want to experience themselves as being in pain. They want to experience themselves as being in control. So it's, you know, I, I, I don't mean to be so therapeutic about it, but to help them um, reconnect with that experience of being a child and being scared and being, you know, frightened for themselves but also also probably for their mother is kind of, in my opinion, the sort of seed of empathy. Like, I think it's all about empathy. If you empathize with someone, you're probably not going to beat them up unless they go crazy and they're attacking you. So if you can help someone who's a batterer see this person that they feel justified in treating badly, that they're actually doing something wrong, you know, and that, that hurts them, and that hurting them should also hurt themselves, I think that you've done a lot, so. But it's, you know, like a lot of, you know, like needle exchange and the health, it's a very politicized, controversial, is that, should we do that? Is that promoting, you know, you know, using drugs, the whole thing. Well, with batterers, it's, it's kind of, the whole movement is, very dehumanizing to men who are abusive, and 
I personally believe that that is why there's so little effective treatment is because the movement has dehumanized men who are uh, you know, violent in their homes. Um, so you've mentioned how you're the serial founder, and then, but you've also had a few mentions like, oh, we couldn't get funding for that, and yep. blah, blah, blah. So there's that, mm -hmm. and then, then, so my question is, for a lot of us who are here at Middlebury and interested in these ideas of social change and community organizing, yeah. what would you, what advice can you offer as we like head out into the world and that kind of balance of, you know, trying to found something on your own or trying to engage in some way and trying to have the support and resources, you know, what's, how do you go about doing that, you know? Oh, that's such a hard question. Um, well, one of the best skills I ever learned, and I learned it when I was in graduate school, is to write a grant proposal. The best, really, it's probably one of the best things I ever learned to do. And it's a little bit of an art, you know, it's a special way of writing, and it's a special way of conceptualizing your work that is driven by the funders. You know, they want it to sound a certain way. They want you to be able to address things in a particular way. So if you can either, uh, I've never taken a class in grant writing, but I've raised a hundred million dollars. So, you know, something was good about my ability to write, but the other thing that was good was that I knew exactly what I wanted to do, and I, I mean, not exactly, like, but I knew what the vision was, and I was able to communicate that to people, and that was effective. Um, it's changed a lot, I have to say, since the recession and now things are back. There's a lot of money out there. Accessing it is a different kettle of fish. It's like dating, I've decided. <laughs> and really, I feel like a lot of it is even more driven by personal relationships now than it used to be. It, there used to be more kind of open competition and transparency in the funding world. I feel like a lot of it now is very much about meeting the right person, exciting them about your idea, and having them invest in it or share your idea with other people who can invest in it. Um, this is a place filled with money and privilege. And the more you can hone your ideas here and connect with people who can connect you with uh, resources, be that people that can help you uh, with a place to go, um, connections to other people who are interested in philanthropy, the better you'll be. Uh, but really being able to articulate what it is that you want to do and understand where you fit in the universe, because you're not alone, you know, there are 5,000 other people who are interested in recycling, right? So what is unique about your recycling project? Is it where you're doing it? Is it with whom? you're doing it? Is it the strategy that you have? Is it, so you have to, in a way, specialize. You have to make sure that you are distinguishing yourself from the many other worthy causes that there are out there, in particular in the similar, uh, you know, the similar uh, world. And um, nothing succeeds like success. So you get your first uh, grant and you do what they now call leveraging it. And, um, one of the best ways, I think, to raise money is to get someone to front you a little bit and use it as a challenge grant and say, you know, I just got $5,000 from blah, 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 and if you give me 5000 more, they'll match it. And if, you know, so it's kind of like a, you know, a game of checkers where you're trying to king someone and you just try to keep doing that until you have. But the other thing I have to say is you've got to do it. You've got to do it and then try to get money. I mean, there are people out there in the world that have venture capitalists behind them. To me, it seems like a lot of that is product-oriented rather than change or community-driven. Um, but if you do it and you have something, you are, you, you've proven several things. You've proven that you have an idea that's that you've moved forward. You've proven that you have the capacity to actually think an idea and make it real, and um, that you've been willing to put yourself kind of on the line for it. And that's harder for some people than others, given their 
finan the financial realities and the other kind of family commitments in their life. But um, and so if that's the case, you need to collaborate. You know, you really and collaboration is, uh, I think, just an uh, important thing. Work whatever you do. Um, you're not alone in wanting to do that work. Building a coalition or a collaboration is, I think, an important way to move forward in the world. And you know, I think one of the issues I have with the whole world of social entrepreneurship is this idea that we are super whoever we are, men or women, and that we're going out there and we're going to do this and it's going to be the best thing that ever happened and we are the person that made it happen. You know, I don't think that's the way things work and I don't think that's the way change happens. Even though there need to be leaders, there's no doubt that leaders are a galvanizing force, but it's they, it's false to think that, you know, one person is really able to make that kind of change happen and many hands make light work and finding ways of building positive collaborations where resources are shared and work product is shared is a really great thing to do. That was a long answer. <laughs> Without a lot of specifics, I'm afraid. Yeah. On that note, would you consider yourself a natural collaborator, someone that's naturally able to like, gather people towards your cause, or is that a skill that you've learned over time through your experiences? Um, I think both, um, but you know, I'm old enough that the first work I did was in a collective. <laughs> so they don't, I don't know that they exist that much anymore. And when I first started in this collective, I had a lot of trouble because I was like, I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to really like make joint decision making, do my part, bring that part back together, problem solve with people. but. Um, the other thing about collectives is that there's a lot of um, negative and positive feedback that go on. So I got a lot of feedback about, why did you do that? Why didn't you talk to me about it? Why did they do that? You know, so I feel like I learned, hard, I learned, I don't know, it wasn't the hard way, but I learned by trying to uh, be part of something bigger than me. And, but I, I definitely wasn't good at it at first. And um, I feel like I'm very collaborative. I, I have um, I maybe even air on the side of uh, collaborative, but it's just I, I really believe in it. And it's you know this project with David, um, you know never would have happened without, or it would have happened. It would have taken three more years for it to happen without that collaboration. And we're both getting we we've, we've become friends. We've gotten a lot out of it personally. We've gotten a lot out of it professionally. The students have gotten a lot out of you know. So it's a win 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 win. You know. Kind of So you've done so much from affecting policy change to helping students realize their potential um, in their future. And that, since the majority of our CSC fellows are here and they're planning their summers and field work, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you have any advice along the lines of collaboration and as they start to orient themselves towards different communities for them in the field. Well, I mean, I understand that the internships are with specific organizations, right? So you, people will be partnered with that organization. Um, I think that the some things to assume are that you have a lot to give, that you have real value to bring, and that even though you may be in a really major learning point in your life, that you have um, ideas and opinions and experiences that are really vital to the organization, they wouldn't want you otherwise. Um, that you have a lot to learn because you're working with people who are more seasoned and have uh, different kinds of experience and that the more you can talk to those people and get their ideas and thoughts about uh, the world and their work and how they did it, the richer your experience will be and you'll end the internship with a lot of in, of, of stuff that's not going to necessarily go on your resume, but is going to really um, bring you great joy and great progress in your life. And that, in my opinion, relationships are everything. And the deeper the relationships you can build with the people around you, the more likely you are <coughs> to be, uh, for them to have you back. 
for them to link you with other people that are in your field of interest, uh, to write you great letters of support, to uh, start an office in Boston with you. Start, you know, there are all sorts of things that will come out of your connections with, uh, with employers and, and with people who are, are leading your internships. And, um, and, you know, I think that even if you are interested in product design and you're working in a social change organization, there are elements of that work that are cross-pollinatable and that you can bring uh, those two worlds together in uh, really dynamic ways if you just let those thoughts, you know, kind of cross one another. Um, you, things are more connected than you think sometimes, and I, I think it's important to think in a more kind of synthetic way often than, you know, this is, this, this, this is the path and I'm on that path and that path is going to get me to that end result that uh, the broader your experience and connections can be, the better off you're going to be uh, when you do get to that end. Go get them. <laughs> <laughs> now come help me solve. <laughs> and with Chad, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for coming. And um, like Alyssa said, um, we would love to have.